Beautiful. All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the talk on covering security anomalies in the cloud. I think this is slightly different than what the title was for the uh, kind of formal submission. Somebody else put that title there, and I felt it was a little bit too markety uh, for, for what I actually want to be going through, which is going to be a lot of kind of uh, you know actual technical details. The majority of this talk is going to be the demo. So we're going to start off with kind of you know just some high level level setting. Uh, we'll, we'll get into to kind of my background a bit, uh, just because I think it'll be relevant here. And then uh, this will be presented primarily from a developer standpoint. I am a developer. I've been a developer for most of my career. So I'm not kind of a security guru. Uh, so, so if you're kind of coming for you know the, the really elite hacker uh, presentation, like this probably won't be it. Though there's a lot of great folks uh, at the company that I could definitely point you towards who have done a lot of great presentations like that. Uh, so uh, let's start off with the, the kind of easy stuff, uh, which is, uh, oh yeah, this this thing. I, at some point, I should actually read one of these and know what they're for. But uh, don't don't do anything illegal or bad. Uh, hopefully. Uh, now the really easy stuff is who the hell am I? Uh, so I am Adam Larson. I'm a field architect at a company called Lacework. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm kind of a longtime dev, so I've been an engineer for most of my career. I actually uh, started off at Azure, uh, working kind of the early cloud iterations, figuring out what the heck to do with all these box products at Microsoft and how to turn them into cloud services, which is kind of a, a cool, pivotal time to, to be at that company. Uh, but then I actually joined a company called New Relic about seven years ago. So I was actually an engineer on what has now become the, the infrastructure product. Uh, I was a PM at New Relic. I uh, did some some uh, kind of uh, go to market engineering, sales enablement, product marketing. So kind of uh, ran the gamut over there. So I will inevitably be fanboying over uh, New Relic throughout this call as well. But uh, I left there about six months ago, and uh, kind of kind of jokingly, it feels like I didn't really leave. You know, like uh, Lacework is actually very, uh, I would say, philosophically and architecturally aligned with New Relic in a lot of ways. So uh, that will make this presentation pretty pretty seamless for anybody who's already familiar with New Relic and that you know it's kind of all the same talking points, but now I'm going to say some security acronyms around them. A uh, couple personal things, you know, like, like uh, working in Azure, I worked on a lot of kind of BI and ETL tools. Uh, so so already big in kind of you know, the big data space early on. I uh, worked at New Relic for a long time, so I became kind of really, really big into data there. And Lacework is also, you know, kind of one of our taglines is we're turning security into a data problem. So, uh, yeah, like I've, I've kind of realized uh, even without intentionally doing it, I just gravitate towards, you know, like, like taking the guesswork out of tech and just, you know, using raw data to make informed and automated decisions. So uh, that will inevitably be a theme throughout the rest of this talk as well. And then uh, not really relevant to anything in the talk, uh, but my way of coping with the pandemic was to pick up a Rubik's Cube and see how good I could get at it. Uh, and I did get to sub 20. Uh, again, not really a crazy accomplishment. There's a lot of teenagers who are much better than I am, but it took me a long time. So I'm going to tell people about it. So uh, that is how that got onto the slide. Uh, all right, so now that we're kind of past who I am, let's talk about the more important, uh, why are you here today? Like, what are we actually gonna talk about? What's this presentation gonna be oriented around? And uh, it really, this should have been the title of the presentation in the first place, which is just security is really freaking hard. Uh, you know, security has always been kind of a, a very, uh, you know, I would say challenging topic. Uh, you know, like I think one of the things that not a lot of folks think about that I always like to use to frame this is, when I think about my time as a developer, I have a bunch of tools available to me. You know, like I, I have to worry about, you know, it's like like my my web server and all the configurations on the host and operating system. And like there's all of these kind of things that I have to be dealing with, but I really only need one happy path to work. Like you're like, I don't really have to care about kind of all the nuance of all of the technology that I'm using or interfacing with. I just need the application to be responding in an efficient amount of time and I'm good. Like, you know, it's like kind of problem solved for the most part. Uh, unfortunately, like when it comes to security, security has the challenge where they have to worry about every single possible edge case. Like, you know, it's like they have to know all of the configuration details of every technology that's in play. Uh, you know, they have to know kind of all of the nuance of how different technologies working together can create exploits. And then what makes it even worse is that when you think about, you know, from a malicious standpoint, if I were the attacker in a security kind of scenario, the attacker has the same benefit that the developer does. Of like, they don't really need every possible way to get into the system. They just need one of the ways to get into the system uh, to, to work out for them. And then they can kind of parlay that into more and more access. So, so the security folks are really the ones fighting off their back foot. And what 
really uh, kind of makes this even worse and sadder is that it's not getting easier. Uh, you know, it's like like development, you know, in my opinion, has gotten a lot easier throughout my career. Uh, you know, it's like like I, I would say the tooling, the concepts, the, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, like surrounding processes and just kind of uh, like industry awareness has really evolved in a lot of positive ways. You know, like I think about you know, the, the cloud, you know, like, I, I'm not going to say the cloud is happening. The cloud has happened, uh, you know, so, so that's not really a novel thing to, to say, but like concepts like DevOps, uh, you know, things like containerization, like they've all made development a lot more efficient and arguably a lot easier than, you know, maybe it traditionally has been, especially for the scale of applications and the complexity of those applications that we're able to deliver now as an industry. Uh, the challenge is that again, because security people don't have to worry about just the happy path of all this new tech and they have to worry about every single like you know, like 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 random configuration like you know, like new hole that's opened by these things the surface area has just grown so incredibly broad uh that like you know it's like security has not gotten easier and it's arguably gotten probably exponentially harder as we've continued to evolve the tech that's surrounding application development uh I don't know if it's it's true for all of you, but like I've definitely had my moments like, you know, before I joined a security company and had the empathy that I probably built up now where it's like I was really worried to engage security when I was doing developments like you know, like like I was an engineering manager and I'm like, crap, like if we tell the security team about this thing, like, you know, it's like, like, I feel like I understand the risk well enough and I'd be willing to take that bet. But would they are they going to make me pull this whole thing out? Are we going to miss our release? Are we going to have to take production down? There's a lot of, you know, kind of like scary things that come with security having to worry about so much nuance and not really having the resources to fight those battles. Uh, and then the last uh, kind of topic here, which is, uh, you know, like just the the cherry on the the uh, 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 ice cream cake uh, suite of choice, uh, which is that there's not really an established industry solution for how to deal with cloud security. You know, it's like as the clouds kind of taken off, like the old tools that were kind of like, you know, like used for security, like all the old malware detection and the firewalls, like, you know, like they they have limited efficacy in the cloud. But for the most part, like. They weren't built like you know, like for that technology. They don't really understand the concepts and the new ways that kind of folks engage with the systems. So like you know, it's like there's not really like like okay, I can just throw more money at this problem, or I can you know just like you know, like like grab this thing that like I've already invested in and just kind of lift and shift it to the cloud, just like I did with my development story. It's really like security is really freaking hard. It's you know getting progressively more broken as time goes on, and there's not really a solution that like we kind of all have like established in the industry right now. Uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about kind of, you know, what I would consider some of the more bleeding edge tools, like the company that I work for, like for Lacework, like where we're actually kind of resetting the way that we approach security as a whole. Uh, but like, I just wanted to kind of tee this up and really to drive that home, like, you know, like for, for the folks that aren't super familiar, like, you know, it's like, this used to be what application development looked like when I started developing. Like, you know, it was, it was canonically called the three-tier architecture. You had, you know, some JavaScript that was generally not super uh, elaborate. You had your backend server uh, application or all your business logic, generally one big monolithic thing or maybe a small subset of individual things on servers that you probably had fun names for. They were named after like where I worked. So, like we call them like, you know, like after different Star Wars ships and things like that. So there were a lot of, uh, you know, kind of like I would say complex problems, but a lot of easy to understand uh, kind of tasks. Like you kind of knew what you were protecting because when it came to this architecture, really what you were doing was drawing a line around this. You know, like there was some cross-site scripting attacks and, you know, cross-site request forgery and there was some client tier stuff. But for the most part, like, you know, like security teams really drew their lines around here. Like, you know, things like physical security were a big thing, big firewalls that like really cared about like what network traffic was going in and out. Like it was not easy again with the, the immaturity of the tools and the practices at the time, but it was easy to understand at least what your kind of goals actually were. Uh, now contrast that with today. Uh, I love this slide. Uh, like, you know, like, like I, I assume many of you have kind of seen this before, but this is actually the marketing slide for the CNCF, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation which is just a barfing of all of the different technologies that go into modern cloud native uh, development. And, you know, it's like, you can kind of see, like, you know, it's like when I think about that three tier architecture, like there was nuance of like different languages and, you know, different operating systems, like I mentioned, uh, none of that is actually encapsulated here. Like, you know, like, like, like one of the things that I think is really interesting is like, 
if I mastered every single piece of technology on this page, I would not be able to deliver an application because I still like, like don't have things on here for like, what language am I actually writing in? Uh, you know, it's like, like, like anything about business logic, which is really the main concern for most developers isn't encapsulating this. This is all about the infrastructure and the surrounding tooling to deliver software, not the actual software development process, you know, necessarily itself. So uh, again, you know, like, like when I think about this from a development perspective, I can cherry pick, you know, five or six different things from this thing and deliver a web experience for my business. And like, you're like, cool, like, you're like, Bob's my uncle, I'm done. Uh, now, any security professional, unfortunately, has to worry about all of these things, especially if the organization isn't consistent in the technology that they're deploying across teams. Now they have to worry about like, you know, it's like, okay, this team has this thing over here. I need to understand that at an intimate level because any one of these can be the source of a breach that leads to the business, you know, showing up in headlines or being taken to their knees through a ransomware attack. So what used to be, you know, this graph or this chart of like, really simple, logical to understand application is now much more akin to this chart. Uh, like, like I, I think that this, this is probably one of my favorite ways to, to kind of describe what modern app development looks like in that, uh, you know, it's like, like, it's just a smorgasbord of random crap that nobody really wants to touch. Uh, you know, it's like, like after it kind of goes through the first development cycle, like I'm sure like, you know, it's like if, if I'm uh, chatting with developers on this call, which I assume I am, like we're all familiar with like that one piece of the the software that's critical to everything that was written by some, you know, rock star dev, you know, five years ago that left the company that nobody really understands and nobody feels super comfortable. Like, it's like, oh, like I, I know that bug's there, but if we touch it, we'll probably break everything forever. Uh, so, so I'd prefer not to, you know, and like sometimes like, you know, like that, that's not even like internal code. Like a lot of times it's like, in order to deliver the customer experiences that like, like are kind of expected by all of our mutual customers, you really have to leverage, you know, uh, you know, kind of like tools from open source or, you know, things from developers in, you know, like random parts of the world that were just kind of like really great devs that did some great, you know, kind of edifice groundwork uh, that like, you know, it's like, like you want to use to leverage to get further along in the story, you know, we're all kind of standing on the backs of giants, but that leads to this very, I would say, precarious uh, development cycle, like where nobody really understands the full extent of what they have deployed in their system. Like, I think, it, I think it's very rare to have somebody that you would feel comfortable saying like, okay, explain to me all the nuance of every single microservice in your stack, all the technologies and libraries that are incorporated throughout. Uh, so, so that makes security even harder because there's no consolidated knowledge anywhere around these topics either. Uh, I do see the chat is, is kind of quiet by the way, like, like, I thrive on like like engagement. This is not meant to be like a super like you know like uh, 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 a big thing. So if for whatever reason like like you know don't feel formal. Like ask questions in line. If you feel like I'm calling bullcrap uh, or like like lying, you know call it out. Uh, all right. So getting into you know kind of like you know just the encapsulation of like like what are the biggest challenges that are actually arising from kind of everything that we've chatted about so far with like the the new modern software development. The the first of which is one that I kind of already called that out is like you can't really deliver modern tech experiences in-house anymore. Like oftentimes you're starting with, you know, third party or open source libraries to kind of bootstrap things to get it going. So you can focus on your business logic, which is makes sense. We shouldn't reinvent the wheel every single time as developers, but it creates challenges where like, there's not necessarily standardizations around those open source libraries. There's not necessarily implicit trust with the developers who have written these different systems, though they are integral parts of your system. And, you know, from a security perspective are opening doors. Uh, now the next one, as I mentioned is again, the inability, uh, to, oh, Sue, cool. Uh, so far so good in the chat. I appreciate that. Uh, so the next one is the inability to understand the systems. As I mentioned, like systems are just complex. Like, you know, it's like, like the, the rise of microservice architectures is exactly right. Like, like we shouldn't be building big monolithic scary applications anymore because like, you know, they were terrible to maintain. Anytime you touch something, the whole thing would break. They took, you know, like literally like half hour to deploy, like, like build times, like, you know, like, like kind of took forever. Like they were nightmares, but like, you know, like the rise of microservices means that there's very little consolidated knowledge in any one place. And, you know, it means that individual teams generally do their own things. Uh, you know, there's variance between the different teams. There's less opportunity for standardization, which again, just leads to this problem of ballooning uh, uh, kind of surface area. And then the finest one, or final one that I don't think a lot of people think about, but it's something that like, you know, kind of like really, really dawned on me is like, so DevOps is, I, I think one of the best movements. I mean, like, I don't think anybody really disagrees that DevOps is a bad idea anymore. You know, it used to be when I wrote software uh, at Microsoft that like, 
I would write the production code. I would get the service working on my local box. I'm like, cool, thumbs up, everything works. And then I would hand it off to some team that I didn't even know. Like I never met them. Like, like we exchanged emails sometimes and things went wrong, but like they were then responsible for like deploying into production, scaling it, you know, protecting it, kind of like all of that production software deployment stuff really existed with a completely different entity. And I was just the one kind of like, you know, like, like creating the sprockets in the, the factory. Uh, and what that has, what's changed with the DevOps movement is basically now I, as the developer, am also involved in the process of deploying and scaling and maintaining my applications in production. That's great because like I have the domain knowledge, I can help with like the triaging. I'm definitely not like, you know, like a domain expert on all those aspects, but like I have the keys and I can help and like, you know, like, like I can do more and offload some of that, that burden. Uh, which is, you know, nice because I can kind of shepherd that thing end to end. And like, you know, that means that like, there's not gonna be discrepancies between my local development and like, you know, the deployment. And if there are, like, I can address them immediately. The challenge with that though, is that like, from a security standpoint, as I said, like, I'm not a trained security professional. Like, like I'm a developer that, you know, vaguely cares about security, but I also care a lot about, you know, application efficiency, test coverage. Like I've got a whole, like, you know, like uh, amalgamation of things that I care about as a developer that like, like really are not just security are not optimized for security. And I have the keys, like, like I can go into the cloud account and I can change the configurations. I can do a bunch of things that kind of open the doors uh, for potentially malicious actors or hackers to get into the system and do bad things. And like, you know, it's like, like, I don't necessarily know all the implications of all the things that I'm doing to optimize for the customer experience from a security standpoint all the time. And DevOps has kind of made that problem a lot worse in a lot of ways, uh, though, obviously, again, it's made a lot of things a lot better. So, uh, all right, I've, I've spent a long time digging us into a very deep pit of despair. Uh, like, you know, talking about like, kind of like why, you know, security is important, especially from a developer standpoint, you know, like kind of what the, the challenges that we're all facing as an industry are. Uh, but let's start digging our way out of this hole, getting a little bit more uh, kind of hopefully useful and positive and start talking about what the solution actually is. So I think that it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, it's like, like when you think about like kind of how security was traditionally approached, it used to be that like, you know, the security team was essentially responsible for responsible for guessing what would go wrong. They, they kind of like knew what the system was. They had a good understanding of the architecture as a whole and the expected behaviors. And they would just say like, okay, if you know, like this thing gets logged into by this person, if somebody creates an admin user, it's like, there are these very kind of generic triggers that would be like rough indicators of a compromise uh, that like, you know, it's like basically like where the extent. And the challenge with that is that if you're only doing the things that you guess, first off, you're missing all the unknown unknowns, the things that you didn't foresee, the people, you know, breaking in through the chimney instead of going in through the front door or a window. Like, you know, it's like you're completely blind to that. So that's that's kind of one obvious thing. But then the other thing is that like if you try to mitigate that and you try to be overly aggressive with kind of the, the rules that you set up for what you're gonna be uh, looking for, you generally end up with this problem of just like, you know, like kind of like we call it alert fatigue collectively, but like, you know, again, it's just kind of barfing data onto the screen. Because you know, it's if I'm in IT and I'm an admin, I'm going to be creating new admin users pretty regularly. I'm going to be logging into AWS and changing a lot of configurations. I'm going to be doing things that might look inherently suspicious. Uh, like you know, it's like if I'm just looking at them from like a pure like, hey, look, like this is what a hacker would do. But I do them every day, and they're part of my job. Uh, so so that's kind of uh, uh, not something that I want to be notified of every single time. You know, Joe Schmo like does his job every single day. And it washes out the actual things that I do care about, those needles in the haystack, like where there are actual events that actually are malicious and are deviations from the norm. So instead of focusing all your time, spending your time guessing about how folks might attack your system, spend more time just discovering the attacks when they happen and actually turn it into a data problem. Get away from the like, 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 oh, like, like I have all this great industry domain knowledge about like, like my like specific applications and I'm the domain expert and it's going to be easy for me to predict what will go wrong. And instead, just look at the data and say, like, what's new? What's novel? What haven't we seen happen before? So, uh, you know, kind of like getting a little bit more specific on that specific topic, like these are just kind of like what I would say are like if I'm auditing probably any software vendor, but specifically a security vendor. These are the things that I'm going to be like, like on my checklist of like, you know, like, like you got to be approaching it this way for it to actually be uh, useful for me. The first one, as I've kind of hit on a couple times, 
spend time looking at data and not guesses. Like a lot of security tools, even modern security tools that are kind of purpose built for the cloud, they're still oriented around you putting in the guesses or them doing guesses ahead of time. Like, you know, it's like, like they, they call them rules based approach, like where you go in and you write, you know, a hundred rules of like, you know, like these things happening are bad. Like that's not like very good because again, it's going to be super noisy or it's going to miss a bunch of things. So you got false positives and negatives on both sides. And instead, like, you know, it's like, like, like we have the technology to like, just find out what normal is. And like, you know, it's like, like, like ML is, you know, it's still novel ish, but like, it's not really like a scary problem anymore. Like we absolutely can uh, like, you know, like, like kind of baseline these systems and get those answers. So like, if I'm dealing with a tool, I don't want to be doing the heavy lifting. If I'm paying some third party vendor, like I want them to take the data, do the analytics and spoon feed me the answers because I don't care about these problems. Like, you know, like breaches are important. I don't want them to occur when they do occur. I want to be able to see them. But like, I don't wake up every day, like, you know, like hoping that I'm going to see a breach in my system and find it. I wake up every day because I want to deliver software and I want to deliver cool customer experiences that like make things easier and give people delight. Uh, so, so data over guesses. Um, as I mentioned, anomalies over rules as well. So, so instead of like, you know, like, like, uh, again, like some of these systems, even the ones that do use data still use the data based on industry best practices or, you know, kind of an amalgamation of like, you know, it's like, like all of their, their kind of like customer data. One of the things that like, like, you know, like, uh, my company Lacework does kind of uniquely that I want to, you know, kind of emphasize, uh, is that instead of having these kind of generic rules like or even like anomaly detection that's kind of based off of like like broad models like incorporating a lot of people that really have nothing to do with you like our business looks nothing like an airline you know it's like we're gonna have different attack vectors there's gonna be different behaviors from our employees instead focus on tools that actually look at your unique system so so like you know it's like again like you know, like the ml can't be global the ml should be unique to your team, your business, your hosts, your, you know, kind of like specific uh, organization such that like, like the anomalies truly actually are anomalous and not just like, oh, yeah, like this is a deviation from the norm of like, you know, like the 95th percentile of all tech businesses in the world, because uh, that's not very effective because you might not be in that 95th percentile. And like, you know, like that's not something that's bad. You know, it's like like your business should be able to function with these tools kind of regardless of, of how normal you are from a software development standpoint. And then the last one, I think this is universal for all tech tools. Like, like I, I'm really surprised that like, like how many times I've seen kind of, you know, uh, uh, different, I would consider snake oil products kind of get out to market and like people buy into them and then like get frustrated, you know, a year later, uh, focus on things that are actually pragmatic, like, you know, that actually orient the data that they're presenting around the fact that a human has to consume it to do something like, you know, it's like, like somebody actually needs to like be able to use the data. I see so many tools that are just this laundry list of check boxes of like, check out all this cool crap that we do. And then you find out that it's basically you just having to craft a bunch of dashboards manually on top of like what ostensibly is just log data uh, for the most part. And it's like super impossible to parse and not very valuable. So I would love as an industry, if we all collectively raised our standards on SaaS vendors of like, you know, it's like, it's not good enough to have the data and to make the data accessible to me. You actually have to analyze and do something meaningful with the data uh, and actually present it in a way that I, I can actually do my freaking job. Uh, so, all right. So that's kind of all the tee up of, uh, you know, kind of like, what's the problem, uh, you know, kind of like, how is the problem progressing? And, you know, like, how can we kind of, you know, like start to, to trend towards a solution to the problem? So I would consider that the boring part, the, the uh, you know, PowerPoint is never my favorite part of any presentation, uh, but now we'll get into the fun stuff. So the actual demo and like, let's start talking about like how, you know, like our company Lacework works in concert with uh, New Relic to actually help, you know, enable all of you as devs and, you know, potentially security professionals make your job easier, like actually actually do things. And uh, before I get into that, I'm going to do a really quick primer on Lacework. I'm going to do this as quickly as possible because I know nobody came here for kind of an elevator pitch on a product. But what does Lacework actually do? I broke it down into kind of this four box matrix. It's not really marketing sanctioned. I just think this is an easy way to talk about it. Uh, so, so the first kind of, uh, you know, uh, axes that we're going to look at here is the surface area over which our product works. So of course we work on workloads. So, so it's like, we're monitoring, you know, like, like kind of like what are hosts normally doing? Like which hosts are talking to which hosts, like who's logging into them, what applications are running on them, what containers are running on them, what 
processes are running inside of what containers, like all of that kind of, you know, traditional, I would say like, like expected security behavior at the workload level is definitely kind of like, like our bread and butter. That's, that's, you know, something that we do really, really well. And we'll speak about that a bit more in a second, but uh, we also do something I would consider a bit novel and like not something that a lot of people think about, which is everybody knows they have to protect their host. They have to make sure people can't SSH into them. But surprisingly, fewer people think about actually protecting their cloud accounts directly as well, because it's not just that, like, if somebody logs into your host and, like, they get access to your data, of course, that's bad. There's risks there. They can parlay that into more access. But if somebody gets access to your cloud account, like, you know, it's like businesses have been literally wiped off the map from that. Like, you know, it's like, like there, there have been, you know, ransomware attacks where people didn't pay and they just deleted everything inside their AWS account. And that business just declared bankruptcy and disappeared. Like, you know, like you, if you don't have offsite backups and like your whole business in AWS and like a hacker gets access to your cloud account, deletes all that stuff, you're done. Uh, like, you know, so, so uh, Lacework kind of understands that. And again, being kind of a cloud native uh, security tool, we have optimized for not just protecting the workloads, but also protecting the cloud accounts themselves. The other uh, kind of like axis here is basically what functionality do we deliver over the surface area? So the first thing is really what we've talked about a lot here, which is really about detections. So when something occurs, when somebody gets into the system, when there's a deviation from the norm, when there's, you know, like we, we baseline the systems all the time and we basically just say like, hey, look, like this user has never logged in from this location before. They've never created an admin user before. They've never like accessed s3 through api before and like like made changes like so there's a bunch of things that we're kind of looking to, to, to detect but those detections again are based off of models that are individual to those entities within your business we baseline every single customer directly uh so so that's where our detection capabilities come about it's really about when something occurs we'll help you find that needle in a haystack but it's not great to just say like yeah like we're going to show you when you were hacked uh you know Attacker dwell time tends to actually be several months. So it's like finding those attacks early and detecting them early on is great. But the reality is that, uh, you know, it's like, like we don't want to be a one trick pony. That's just, you know, like, hey, look, like here's all the hacks that occurred historically on a timeline. We also want to help you prevent those attacks. So we also offer mechanisms to basically ensure that you're locking your doors properly. This is going to be more around the, the engineering kind of use cases of like making sure that you're not adding libraries that have, you know, kind of risk to them, that you're not introducing containers that have a bunch of vulnerabilities. So, you know, just in kind of human layman terminology, like, you know, it's like these are the different parts of our platform. Like we have different names for them and like, you know, like they're, they're fun security acronym aligned. But I, I just want to speak in kind of, you know, really plain English you know, detecting breaches on the host, detecting breaches on the cloud account, mitigating the chances of breaches occurring, uh, basically, uh, within the workloads and within the cloud accounts. That's what Lacework does. Like this, this chart enca encapsulates like what our platform delivers. So there's more stuff here that like are kind of tangential use cases. Like we help a lot with like achieving compliance standards if you're going for like SOC 2 or HIPAA. Uh, but like, it's really because we do the functionality that I kind of have laid out here already in kind of uh, a plain English. So. Uh, that is the tee up of the platform. And now we can actually get into, as I promised, the fun stuff, the, the actual demo. So, uh, we're going to start the demo, hopefully in familiar territory for all of you in the new relic interface. Uh, so, so we're going to, uh, kind of start this off as if it were an observability use case. Um, uh, you know, it's like oftentimes, like, like not a lot of people think about this, but the uh, observability investigations, performance degradations are actually aligned to security or turn into security challenges. So this is kind of one anecdotal example. Like, you know, it's like, again, like our surface area is pretty broad. We do a lot of different things. Uh, but like, you know, like this is just meant to kind of anecdotally show one happy path of, you know, like kind of like how our product works and hopefully give you a sense of kind of the broader uh, implications of investing in a tool like Lacework, hopefully. Um, all right, so here we are on the New Relic APM view. We're looking at this vote application and I, just a demo app that we spun up. So you can see the, the performance degradation is pretty uh, aggressive. Like, you know, it's like, like the thing was generally doing nothing. And then all at once we had a pretty substantial uh, uh, response time spike. So basically our customers were waiting orders of magnitude longer for the application to respond. A lot of things could be the underlying cause of this. Could be bad business logic, could be we got DDoS. Like, like there's a lot of things that New Relic would help me kind of use to triage this. Just for the sake of expediency, like I'm gonna kind of skip over like the normal full triage and investigation process. And I'm gonna say like, like one of the places that I would generally look is in the infrastructure product because uh, there's a challenge that we call the noisy neighbor problem where basically like, We've all opened up Microsoft Word uh, accidentally, like like in the old days on like our laptop, and basically our machine was just hosed for five minutes as it was like loading everything up. 
Uh, so, so, and maybe I just had a really slow computer. So hopefully that analogy works with all of you. Uh, but like essentially what's happening there is like, I've opened up another application. They're both sharing the same CPU and the same memory and the same disc. And like, like they, they all are using the same resources. So that app, new application is basically becoming a noisy neighbor and consuming all of those resources such that the other applications or the operating system itself is basically stunted. Like, you know, it's kind of, that's where those freezes come from, like where it seems like kind of nothing's going on. So that can happen in production applications as well. Basically, you know, it's like like you deploy it out to a host. That host has, you know, likely virtual CPU and memory and all of those things. But if something else gets deployed on that same virtual host uh, or bare metal, like, you know, it's like those resources can be sapped away from it. And like you know, your application can get slower because of something else running on it. So uh, sure enough, when we go to infrastructure, the best way to confirm that is we can actually see, you know, there's a clear CPU spike around the same time as that application spike that we were just looking at. Uh, it looks like it's only around 50%. I think if I zoom in here, yeah. So if I zoom in, I can actually see it spiked up to 100%. I'm sure if I zoomed in even further, it would show like a more clear like spike up directly to 100. So we we have a pretty clear smoking gun from an observability standpoint here. We now know that like, you know, it's like, the CPU on the machine spiked up in concert with this application performance degradation. So I know that there's some resource utilization issue here. Uh, you know, a, continuing again with just kind of the, the canonical uh, New Relic investigation for this uh, specific issue. I can then click on the processes tab and it looks like for this little time window that I'm looking at here, I can actually see uh, the very specific processes that are actually leading to that CPU spike. And I can see that there's this XM rig uh, process that was taking up a lot of CPU. It looks like it was actually deployed twice around the same time or uh, on the, the, it looks like the same host or maybe they're, yeah, same host. So, so the XM rig was deployed twice on the same host, not for very long. Uh, behind the scenes, Sasha's making, uh, it turns out like cloud providers don't like you running uh, malicious software inside of the, the cloud. So we actually didn't run it for very long just out of fear. Uh, otherwise this demo would be a little bit more prominent. Uh, but let's say we didn't know what XM rig was, as I assume many folks on the call may not. Uh, let's just do a quick uh, you know, Google search, figure out what the heck XM rig is. And we'll click on the xmrig.com. Pretty clearly not a good sign. Uh, like where we're gonna, in the top Google result brings me to a uh, turn back now, uh, you know, there are perils ahead kind of view. That's already a bad sign, uh, but looks like there's a GitHub repo here. So probably a little bit safer. And uh, all of the the kind of you know core buzzwords uh, basically are, are going off. And this is a crypto miner. So so basically, what attackers will do is they'll get access to your system. They want to use your compute because compute costs money. Because you know like like you have to use energy and resources and all that stuff. So they want to use your compute to mine bitcoins for them. So then they can basically make a profit. Uh, pretty standard attacker uh, kind of you know like uh, behavior. We see it pretty often. Uh, uh, so, so basically now what we know is that that application vote app got a lot slower, uh, for, for a period of time because the CPU spiked up and the CPU spiked up because this XM rig process got installed on that host, that XM rig process was a crypto miner. Uh, so, so I have a lot of great information from new relic alone here. I now know exactly what host I have to go into to, uh, you know, like, like, uh, like kill minus nine, the crypto miner, if it was still running, I know potentially, you know, maybe I want to like, you know, like make some modifications to like the SSH access or, you know, my security groups, like there's some stuff I can do to mitigate this. Uh, but there's a broader security challenge, uh, that, that kind of gets opened up here, which is how the hell did they get into my system? Like, like what was the initial attack vector? Uh, like, you know, it's like, what other things might they have done from a security standpoint? Like crypto miners don't organically appear on normal systems. You know, it's like, it's very unlikely that, you know, a normal day-to-day -day employee is just gonna be like, yeah, I'm gonna deploy XM rig uh, like on the, the, my spare time and make sure that we're using up all of our CPU. Um, you know, it's like, this is indicative of somebody malicious got onto the system and that should scare you. And New Relic is a great observability tool, but it's not a security tool. And this is where the baton handoff to a product like ours comes uh, about of like, again, philosophically and architecturally, we're very much aligned. We deploy very similarly. We present data very similarly. We're very philosophical about like, like we want the data to actually be actionable. We want it to be pre-analyzed. We want it to be contextualized. Uh, but again, like we have our domain expertise and New Relic has theirs. So it's made the partnership very symbiotic. Like it's, it's, it's actually, uh, been a really, really great relationship. And now, uh, getting a little bit tactical about like, you know, kind of like specifically, uh, how would you continue this investigation if you were that dev who wanted to delve deeper into the security side, or you were handing it off to a security professional 
and you had both of our tools in your your stack. So uh, I do want to before I actually I get into that like before I get into the demo, I always start my my kind of product demos with like what does it take to set up because I've been super frustrated before of like I super excited about a demo that I saw. I'm like, that thing's awesome. Like, like, like that would save me so much time. That'd be so valuable. And then I find out that it's like millions of dollars of consulting fees and time. And, you know, it takes months to even get the thing deployed and like, and I have to maintain it and scale it. And it's just a bunch of crap and cruff that I didn't want to deal with. So like the demo looks cool, but like the, the arduous path to get to that value is so much and so cumbersome that it almost negates the value in the first place. So uh, when it comes to setting up Lacework and New Relic, the the kind of demo and integration I'm going to show you, essentially, you know, it's like obviously you have New Relic and Lacework set up individually. Like, you know, it's like they both deploy, as I said, the same, you know, go based agent, SaaS integration with your cloud provider, like, you know, like a couple minutes there. Uh, the next thing that you would do as part of this integration is you basically want to plumb the Lacework anomaly and prevention detections uh, into NRDB, so into the New Relic database. So how that gets done, I'm not going to go through the process for the sake of time, but like, you know, basically grab an insights insert API key uh, from your API keys view in New Relic, paste that into the Lacework UI as part of a notification channel. Uh, so, so just like an alert notification channel for New Relic. So basically it's just, you know, give it your New Relic account ID and your New Relic insights, insights, insert, insights insert API key. There it is. Um, and then uh, data basically just starts plumbing right after that. So couple more minutes, you know, it's like literally like that's like a five minute flow if you kind of know where you're you're looking for all the keys. But like that basically sets it up where now Lacework is going to plumb that data directly in your tenant. No additional deployments, no crazy configuration. Just give us the data that we need to plumb it over. Um, now, once you've done that, then we kind of get into to kind of like what's the really sexy part and kind of the new functionality from New Relic. So New Relic just launched this thing that they're calling instant observability. Um, they've had, I, I think, several iterations of comparable things throughout the year. Like they had plugins, they had infrastructure integrations. Uh, but most of those are built in house or they were very hard to kind of maintain. But what this instant observability basically allows us to do is like we could always plumb the data into New Relic. Getting into NRDB wasn't really a challenge. But once the data is in NRDB, like, you know, it's like, OK, well, now I got to like write a bunch of NERCL queries or I got to go through the WYSIWYG editor and kind of create the dashboards myself. That's cumbersome and time consuming. And not everybody's you know an expert on, on the two respective data sets and the different ways to kind of uh, uh, click around inside them. So uh, uh, what Instant Observability allows us to do is basically as a third party vendor, we can pre-curate UIs over our data. We can also create, you know, like pre-curated alerts. We could create, you know, pre-curated uh, uh, deployments for uh, instrumentation if that were necessary as well. And then we can basically deploy that or you can deploy that instantly into your account. So now you spend a couple of minutes basically just getting the plumbing rigged up of like, you know, getting Lacework data plumbed into New Relic. But now all you have to do, find Lacework here, alphabetical order, pretty straightforward, and say, I want to install this quick start. That's it. Uh, and then now you basically have pre-curated uh, by us, you know, the, the security experts on our own data, uh, like, you know, like, but that experience is inside of New Relic alongside your observability data. So I, I just want to point out that, like, you know, again, setting this up is not, you know, going to be some bait and switch where it's like, yeah, this is going to look really cool. But if you actually want to do it yourself, it's going to be a nightmare. Uh, it'd be very easy for you to like test this stuff out yourself, which I would encourage all of you to do if you're interested in any of the topics that we chatted about so far. Uh, but what you will get for it is basically uh, right now three dashboards. Like this is going to continue to evolve. We didn't want to pre-curate alerts because it's so hard to find a silver bullet of like you know, like alerts that are relevant for every business, and generally they just become noise. Uh, but like obviously the data is there where you could pre-curate those alerts for yourself, or you could use kind of like the, the data we have here. But we've broken the data down into three dashboards, basically. The first one is a Lacework security overview. Uh, basically, this one is an amalgamation or a mirroring of the New Relic and the Lacework data. Uh, I'm not running anything in the uh, account right now. So if I go to a longer time window, we can actually see like this kind of demo data that we were looking at before. Uh, but essentially, like you know, it's like it shows you what are generally in in indicators of compromise from a security standpoint, but observability data and New Relic. So again, if a CPU spikes, that might be a security problem. If an application response time spikes, that might be a security problem. If request count to an application spikes, that could be a security problem. Bytes going across the wire. Um, but then we take all those indicators of compromise and then we cross-reference them with Lacework data. So this is showing me like how many anomalies have I found on, at the host level? How many new processes were deployed at that particular time window? How many new connections between entities were found during that window? So uh, this is kind of early stage. 
I would love anybody's feedback. Like at the end, I'll, I'll share my email directly. Like if anybody does end up using this and they're like, Hey, look, like this is other new relic data that I use to kind of suss out like, like security stuff. We'd love to incorporate that here. Cause this is still very early stages. And like, we're super receptive to working with all of you to make it better. Uh, but this is kind of the first dashboard, which is really just kind of a quick place to go. And like, you know, like if you're in the middle of an investigation or triaging something, this is just a bunch of things that you can look at to kind of see like, are there any smoking guns? Uh, but the real kind of value prop for me comes in these other two. So we have the anomaly detections. Again, remember we do kind of detections of things that occurred. And then we have kind of that, that uh, more proactive configuration data. And that's where we have the compliance uh, uh, kind of information. So we're going to start with the anomaly detections because I think that this is the, uh, the, the kind of cooler of the two from a demo perspective. And it continues the demo that we were doing before from the durability standpoint. So remember, we've investigated a performance issue. Basically, a customer's had degraded performance, very new relic. We've tracked it down to a specific process. And now that process has turned that observability process, uh, uh, that observability investigation into a security investigation. So by setting up the lacework plumbing, by getting this dashboard here, I can now come in here and I can say, you know, first off, like I can filter all these things automatically. So I can say like, oh, like, I don't actually care about things going on in the cloud account right now because I know this is like process related. So I just want to see the workload data. Like, you know, it's like we can just cut out all of that uh, cloud account data. So that already kind of brings me down to uh, a very small subset of, of kind of information here. I'm actually just going to expand my time window as well uh, just to, to make it more demonstrative that this isn't fake. Uh, you know, it's like like it works at scale and all that as well. Uh, so, so yeah, like, like, like I'm looking at, you know, just kind of the 60 anomalies now that were for this particular demo tenant. Um, I don't want to do any more filtering. Uh, thankfully, New Relic allows me to just kind of come up here and say, show me any Lacework security anomaly detection that you did at the workload level, because we have that filter already set up, that just contains that process name that we already discovered as part of our observability investigation. So I do that, and now I automatically filter down all of these anomalies to the three that contain the text XM rig. And we can see basically like some insight into like what Lacework is actually looking at here. We can see this application made an external connection to a known bad DNS. So we know definitively that talking to this xmrig.com domain is bad. You know, like nothing in your business should logically be doing it. So we call that out as an event. We detected the actual binary, uh, the xmrig file itself, the hash is known malicious. So these are kind of like, like rule based, like they knew the thing. But this one's the interesting one which is this XM rig process running on this host, uh, running as this user connected to this IP or connected to this domain. So this is kind of a duplicate of that top one. But what this is telling me is basically, I don't know if XM rig in this instance is good or bad. Like, like I don't know if this is something that like, you know, it's like, like, like is business logic that you wrote, something that you pulled in from a third party. I don't care. I know that this application has never talked to this domain before. So this is the first time that we've ever seen that. So. The nice thing about this is that, say, for instance, that you had a production application that you've been running for months, and that production application gets compromised. You know, you don't sanitize user input somewhere. Somebody gets, you know, like kind of generic access, like where they can execute arbitrary code. And now all of a sudden they use that generic access to communicate with some other domain. Like, you know, it's like, and maybe that domain is AppGet. Say they're just downloading some other tool. Now, your application talking to AppGet would not be on any rules based list. Like, it's not inherently scary to talk to AppGet. Every host probably does it. Uh, every every uh, uh, Ubuntu or uh, Debian based host would would talk to AppGet. But if that uh, application had never talked to that thing before, we we are going to uniquely identify that like like hey look like this is you know maybe not a bad DNS, maybe not a bad application, maybe this is totally fine. But it's never been seen before because again we're baselining everything off of that specific business. So that's where we become very unique and like where like, you know, again, these investigations become really valuable and that like, we're not looking at just that known bad list, but we're also looking at like, these are just like weird anomalies in your system at a behavioral level, not like a metric, like this number spiked up, but like, I've never seen this person or this process or this host do this thing before. So the nice thing again about this integration is like, I can just click this event. And now like, if I'm going from a security standpoint, like, I can continue that same investigation that we were just doing seamlessly with all the context that I already had. Like I've already found the event that I cared about. I don't have to come in here and reset my time window, like add all my filters. It's not like I'm like going into a completely new tool. 
because of the way that lace work and new relic align it's very easy for me to just come in here now i can see the the who what why where when kind of investigatory information i can get deeper details on the process information i can see other related processes or other related anomalies around the same time again looking to detect like maybe that attacker did other things at that same time window I won't turn this into a whole product pitch for like the the full extent of what lacework can do because there's obviously a lot there. But I do want to point out that basically it's like now again like if you have both lacework and new relic, like it becomes a lot easier for handoff of these issues to security professionals or if you are the one that's kind of owning both of them to make that experience seamless. That connective tissue is really the main value that I want to convey as opposed to like the deep dive details for each respective platform. Uh so, so hopefully that that uh, came through uh, clearly. Everybody uh, at least gets a rough sense. Again, that is just one example. Like, you know, it's like 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 if we kind of just scroll down, like there's a bunch of anomalies. You can see a majority of them. Again, like we're very, very, very worried about like how many high criticals we send through. We generally only want to see like one or two of those, you know, kind of like per day, so people can actually react to them, so people don't get desensitized to them. So you can see that most of the information that's coming through is at that info level. But like, like for these high critical ones, like if I just filter down to those, you can kind of see like, you know, it's like, these are the new processes, this machine making a connection to something that's never talked to before, uh, the kind of like, you know, like the, the anomalous behavior at that kind of workload level, uh, like just at that, that high thing. So very, very uh, uh, kind of, actually, this is probably a better indication of like the types of things that we're looking for. So, so yeah, new, new binary type, known host being bad, login from weird sources, new connections to DNS or IPs, like where we're kind of looking at a bunch of broad generic things rather than a bunch of known nefarious things. Um, the one last thing that I'll kind of call out, just going into the, the uh, compliance side of the house, you know, so as I mentioned, this is more the prevention detail. So, so it's like, whereas the other stuff was kind of like, here's stuff that's happened. And like, you know, you kind of want to suss through all that and see like, has any of these things that happened actually like, like rendered like some real malicious behavior? Or are these actually like indicative of something being bad? This data that I'm showing you here, this compliance violations is more oriented around like, how can I be more proactive in preventing something bad from happening? So, so I can see there's 114 compliance violations. You know, you can kind of see the things that we're looking at here, like ensure no security group allows ingress on, you know, the open internet to port 22, pretty, pretty standard uh, kind of fare there. So, uh, you know, I, I could also, you know, kind of just for the sake of demonstration, come in here and say, I just want to check out my security groups. You know, I'll probably filter down to that same list of, yeah, like, Here's all of the ways that I can kind of improve my security posture by, you know, changing configurations on security posture by on uh, load balancers or sorry, security groups and doing more to, to basically make sure that I'm following industry best practice from a, a, uh, a compliance perspective. And just like I said before, I can actually come down here. I can click into any one of these and I can then be brought contextualized into the lacework interface where now I know, you know, it's like, okay, like here's a specific like, like rule. Here's all the deep dive details all the things that are actually impacted, their specific ARNs. I can use this to track my progress over time. So I'm not emailing back and forth. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, so uh, I'm going to, I'm going to stop there because I feel like I'm getting a little too product oriented. I do want to leave some time for questions. If there are, I think I'm at about time anyway. Uh, so hopefully again, uh, this has given you kind of a rough sense of, of kind of like why security professionals deserve hugs, every opportunity that you can give them. Uh, like, you know, it's like, like, it is not an easy job. Like, like, again, coming from a development background, joining a security company, like it's been really eye opening for me of like how hard it really is and how limited resources or how few resources they have to address the challenges and how all of the tools that are making our lives as developers easier are generally not making security lives easier. So, uh, like the, the real kind of bridging of the gap there is going to be better communication, better tooling, just better efficacy and expectations of the tools that we're putting in place and processes that we're putting in place to be more effective to actually lock down our software so we can spend a lot less time dealing with the crap that we don't want to be dealing with, which is you know removing libraries that have known vulnerabilities and patching crap and uh, you know like the the less fun, not really differentiated uh, uh, tasks. So uh, with that, thank you so much. Uh, as I mentioned, this is my personal email. Please email me if you have any questions, concerns, feedback, thoughts, or you just want to hear more about the, the kind of platform in general. I'm super happy to, to kind of engage in whatever way possible. And uh, thank you. I uh, really appreciate all your time. Enjoy the rest of Nerd Days, all. <laughs>